The point of this panel is really to ask, continue to ask more questions because there are quite a few now in Slido, but also um, we'd like to talk about some bigger picture things that everybody could maybe give their perspective on if, if they have thoughts. Uh, but I thought it might be fun to start with a few more specific questions and then potentially end on a more philosophical big note, if that sounds all right with everybody. So for those of you watching, um, please, Slido is a great place to add questions where this is this is what we're here for. So it's the end of our of our um, wonderful day of the workshop and we can we can pick everybody's brain. Um, so uh, let's see here. Uh, one question was to Tom, does your specifically your architectural approach to enforcing physical constraints require the conservation laws be represented as linear combinations of the variables? Is that a requirement? That's a, that's a really good, good question. So in the first version of our work, it used to be that we needed the constraints to be linear combination of the variables. But in the latest version of our work, we, uh, we showed a, how to handle a nonlinear example. And so to handle constraints that are nonlinear in the inputs or outputs, what we do is, um, and it's, it's all uh, detailed in the preprint, we first transform uh, the nonlinear inputs or outputs uh, uh, into variables uh, in which the constraints are linear using the several ways of doing that. You can use custom data generator um, or custom layers as long as your as long as you can write your um, transformation uh, mathematically, you can usually write it in uh, TensorFlow or whatever uh, library you're using. And then you use the same idea but just inside so you convert at the from the input to uh, the architecture constraint nerds you have con uh, conversion layers and from the architecture nets to the outputs you have conversion layers so that the system is linear inside but non-linear overall so you can still have uh, non-linear constraints um, great and actually i just want to since i have you grab you for another one that's sort of based off that you talked about multiple methods for enforcing physical constraints. So do you have a general workflow of how you figure out or determine which method is best for the specific application? And maybe you can speak more generally to the audience that may want to implement these, how they might go about figuring out which one is best for their application. So, so first I want to acknowledge that I'm definitely not the first one to offer such methods. And especially if you go towards the theoretical physics and neural net and machine learning or fluid dynamics and machine learning um, communities, there's already a lot of these methods. Um, some of them require, for example, predicted Hamiltonian, only certain components of a tensor that has symmetries. I would say it, it really depends on the problem at hand. In general, my advice would be if the if there are obvious way to build your network so that the constraints are verified, uh, do it. So in climate science, it would be, for example, maybe if you care about both fluxes, but also heating rates in your model, go for the fluxes and then consistently calculate the heating rates as uh, differences in these fluxes. And then if you structure your neural network that way, uh, you know that, for example, radiation is going to be conserved and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but the method I proposed in, in a case where, you know, you may not necessarily have such easy ways and the constraints are a bit messy. So uh, I, I, I wrote a general um, and published a more general method, but I would say start with the really easy ones, uh, only output what's necessary. Thank you. Okay, the next question I have, it's Marlena, it's, it's geared mainly towards you, but I think we can make it more general um, to everybody else. So everybody think if you have some thoughts on this for your application, which is in terms of uncertainty estimates or uncertainty quantification, we've already heard a little bit about that today and yesterday, but are there ways to add uncertainty estimates to your causal inference or causal discovery methods? And more generally to the rest of the panel, are, you know, we didn't talk too much about that as a, you didn't talk too much about that as a group, are there ways you're already incorporating uncertainty estimates or are there ways you could see doing that in the future? We'll start with Marlena. Um, yeah, that's a, a good question. And um, I should add probably, um, I think I didn't say this clearly enough, is that um, in causal inference, let's say the, the causal model I talked about, this is completely non-parametric. So then it depends uh, to you and your choices um, 
and let's say how you measure um, effects or how you measure statistical dependence. So I presented, let's say, this um, kind of boring um, multiple linear regression framework because I guess this is basically you know, kind of a state of the art, at least in, um, in the context of quantifying effects of teleconnections. And I guess then you can, of course, also use your standard tools to estimate uncertainty for this. Um, in the paper I presented, um, where you estimate this effect um, on season five data, what we did was we tested or we estimated the effects over different moving windows and the historical um, runs to kind of um, yeah get an estimate uh, about um, yeah the internal um, variability. And what well, turns out, it's not a surprise that also there was quite a lot of fluctuations of this estimate. Um, so yeah, it's completely the approach is really more like a yeah maybe even philosophical setup of um, how we can uh, frame those questions, but then it depends on yeah, your statistics of choice, how you measure it. Anybody else have any thoughts? I mean, you all presented great methods and in terms of how we might work in either uncertainties in our inputs or uncertainties in our outputs or something in between, uncertainty in our models themselves. Tom, do you Tom, go ahead if you have a, an answer. I also don't, I also want to let other speakers, um, of course, express their views. Uh, in in the specific case I presented, uh, because we just built standard artificial neural network, we can introduce stochasticity by using a Monte Carlo dropout, for example, to have several different um, outputs. But in our in our lab, more generally, we exploring generative and uh, stochastic machine learning methods. And for example, we use variational autoencoders on the generative side. And um, and we are thinking of maybe trying out Bayesian neural network on the on the stochastic side. So we have a, an easy method via dropout, but then there are a lot of other promising tools that I think are worth exploring for the community. All right, we were thinking about mixing in some more philosophical questions here. So one question I have is for the whole panel, what are challenges or roadblocks you see in your applications of KGML in the broader weather climate field and how might we overcome them? Um, well, I can start. Um, I would say data. We need a lot of data in order to apply these things. and. For me, I'm working on subseasonal timescales, but if you're looking at more like decadal timescales, we don't have a lot of data. And so if you wanna use KGML for this like type of application, you'd need to hopefully increase your data somehow, maybe using a model of some sort, but. It's interesting that we're talking about knowledge guide machine learning. How can we bring in the knowledge? It seems like we have a lot of knowledge. We need more data to merge it with, right? to really test things. I can add, um, I guess one of the challenges I see is just the continued physical understanding as to what is happening or, or asking whether there is or isn't um, physical information that our model is learning. And um, for as far as my talk, I um, share some results from permutation future importance. And uh, there are some limitations with that analysis as well, where we can end up uh, with confirmation bias um, so let's say we get different results if we explore different error metrics uh, to use for the permutation feature importance analysis. Um, and then we might end up just using what seems to confirm what we already know. And if the goal ultimately is to gain knowledge from machine learning, but we're battling our own confirmation bias, when do we actually get to learn new things that maybe we didn't expect? Everybody is nodding vigorously. Does anybody want to add to that? So how do we overcome our confirmation bias? Uh, one of my postdoc mentors, David John Gagne, has suggested writing down what I think is going to come out of the analysis before <laughs> running it. So that'd be a, a very simple way uh, to start battling that. I think another thing that's so hard to do is because we have so little data, we often do the two-way split rather than the three-way split. 
And so we don't really have our test data. And we, we check once in a while, how, do, how does our model do on the test data or analyze things? And it's just so hard to really, with little data, to really keep several years really apart and not use them for a long, long time, right? Any yes, other comments? I, I'm sorry. Yes, I just, yeah, I second that. And actually also what uh, Kirsten said before. So um, and, and in this context, I also think it's um, kind of this, this methods on, on domain shifts, on uh, regime shifts is also quite exciting so that we can have less training data or that we can use training data and then apply these results for different um, case or different uh, model setup, different data case. I think this is um, yeah, important to do, especially we have this variety of different models and um, where just from the causal perspective, of course, there's also this um, concept of trans transportability of different causal models and, for example, transporting knowledge we have on the models uh, on the observations. And I think this is um, exciting and worth studying. Okay, so we, we have another great question that I think applies once again to everyone here. So we are used to always telling everyone in talks how great our method is. So one big question is, what are the real limitations? And I think everybody touched a little bit on this throughout their talk, but maybe everyone could take a moment and, and, and tell us what it, you see are the major limitations of, of the particular method or tools that, you, that you're using right now. Maybe we could start. Kirsten, um, the question was originally geared towards you, so maybe we'll call you out and then we can go around. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, so my methods were using layer-wise relevance propagation, and um, there are some limitations to LRP. Uh, mainly, there are some neural network setups that just don't work, such as like UNet, where you can't back propagate through the model to understand what it looked at. Um, yeah, and it does work for things like CNN and ANN and LSTM, but I think a, a big limitation is if you want to use LRP, you need to think about how you want to set up your model before you go and try to approach a problem so that you can actually use LRP to analyze it. Jerry, do you want to, not to put you on the spot, do you have thoughts on this? Oh yeah, I was gonna jump in and say that for meta-learning, something that we've observed is that um, right now meta-learning methods work really well if you have very few shots, like just maybe one to five examples from each class. But then once you start to have more and more data, then actually the, we've observed pre-training or even training from scratch to overtake meta-learning or MAML. And you, you should think that, I mean, I, I think that that is kind of strange because even with more shots, more samples per class, you're still optimizing the model directly to do well on those larger data sets that you might have. Um, but I think the answer might lie in the fact that because there's all these second order gradients, the loss landscape is quite complicated. It's quite not, um, it's not convex at all. So I think people speculate that that really makes it difficult to find um, a good or a better local uh, minimum than compared to say just pre-training or training from scratch. So something that I'm interested in exploring more is whether as you increase the amount of data that you, that you have to maybe more realistic data set sizes like in the tens or hundreds, which we do have in our fields, um, you can still get the benefit from meta learning of um, explicitly learning how to perform well on each task. So there's more of a gradient that you can slide between like um, having only one example to like a thousand examples and have it have it uh, still outperform some of the more naive training methods. That's exciting. Anyone else? Um, yeah. <clears throat> oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, Maria and then Marlena. Okay, great. Um, so I use saline CMAPs and um, I showed a few um, examples that um, showed some features that made sense physically to me. But, um, but if we consider saliency maps in just more general, even for my example, there's a lot of saliency maps that we can generate from our models that are trained. So if we were to just take a look at the last dense layer that I had, that's 
32 saliency maps, so 32 neurons plus the 20 inputs. And so you end up with a very large number of saliency maps to sift through. And that can lead to cherry picking and uh, cherry picking by a human that uh, identifies some features that make sense to them. Um, and so again, posing another challenge or a barrier for um, this goal of us wanting to extract knowledge from these models. Um, yeah, um, I guess I wanted to say that um, I think uh, maybe a specific answer um, or a specific limitation of, of my method or my approach would be that um, since everything is coupled in the climate system, we do need some kind of time lag between processes to really um, understand um, cause effect relationships. So I don't think it's really uh, built uh, at the moment to address more like chicken egg problems, especially, I don't know, any meaningful interactions, for example. So that's why I think teleconnection or more the sub-season, season time scale makes sense. Um, but maybe a bit uh, lazy answer would also be that it's, um, well, all of the methods have limitations. So more like the, the biggest limitation is if we think that one method can answer all the questions. So uh, it's really picking the method to your question, but yeah, but this is also very <laughs> Tom, did you want to chime in before we go on to the next one? I think everybody else has answered. Up to you. Uh, yes, I can, I can discuss one limitation per method I, I showed. So for the one where you enforce physical constraints within neural network, even to within machine precision, I would say the main limitation is that if you don't code it well or efficiently, uh, you will, the, net, the neural network will be significantly harder to optimize than, for example, a brute force neural network. Um, and that becomes even more obvious when you go to nonlinear constraints where you need those conversion layers or however you manage to uh, transform, reformulate the constraints inside of your neural network architecture, you need it to be very efficient. Otherwise it's hard to gain, to get the same level of performance than you would with a brute force uninformed neural network. Uh, and then for, this, for the second method, the climate invariant network, I would say the main drawback is to have a good, strong physical prior of how you go from one regime to the other. So in the case of thermodynamics, uh, the, therm the thermodynamics of climate change, uh, we are quite lucky in a sense because the closest Clapeyron equation gives us an extremely strong prior as to how water is going to evolve as the climate warms um, in the atmosphere. But um, I'm still looking for good output rescaling. I've been uh, trying for now, and I have a lot of physics background, but still it's been months of trying tens of different rescalings to find which one is the best. So even if the results can be very dramatic uh, and satisfying, once you find the right scaling, I would say finding this physical prior requires a lot of collaboration with domain knowledge experts. Um, so asking a lot of people around you in practice. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, the last question, well, I think it might be the last question because it's a long one, uh, is a combination of two questions here from Randall Barnes and Paul Hansen. Um, so when should or how should KGML topics be introduced to science students? For example, only in grad school? And that combined with a question from Paul, what do you wish you'd had in training? So any suggestions for our instructors of what we should teach when and where? I'm assuming training didn't mean like your training data set. It was just now it means. <laughs> okay, okay. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> um, I wish I had more of a computer science background. Honestly, as an atmospheric scientist, I feel like my job is to be a data scientist, but for my application. And so I really think that I had more um, experience with with computer science coming into this thing. I can second that. Um, the computational side is so important for pre-processing the data. Um, I guess if we were to give some percentage of the time that we actually spend training our models versus pre-processing the data, it'd be like 90 to 95 percent pre-processing as opposed to training. Uh, so really learning how to parallelize what we can or, um, yeah, just optimize 
that workflow and that that pipeline before even getting to the training part um, makes up so much um, of our work. So being as efficient as possible in that uh, realm would have been very useful for me. And it's something that I've been having to pick up along the way. And I have had no formal training uh, per se, but I've just picked up and, and learned from different people. Um, I will jump in quickly um, and say, oh, uh, oh I was just no, going to say ahead. what Maria said about pre-processing. That's often where a lot of the science comes in is how do you pre-process? And that's so there's the optimizing the pre-processing side. But I think, Maria, you bring up a great point that's really at this heart of KGML, which is this knowledge part. And often that those decisions you had to make for what, what how did you standardize and why and what does the input mean? Is, is so fundamental to what you ultimately get out. And it's so rooted often in the science. But I think that's a really important point. And then Sherry, go ahead. I'm sorry for interrupting. No, no worries. I was gonna say that um, my background is more coming in as a um, someone in computer science and applied math. I think it's good to get through the building blocks of um, obviously basic computer science and then working your way up to machine learning um, with statistics but I think there could be more classes that merge uh, machine learning and uh, domain knowledge. So I think, I think once people, it doesn't have to be at the ground level though. I think that's probably uh, just because of the number of steps it takes to get through the computer science and machine learning curriculum probably would mostly be for people at the grad school level. But I think, I think I see a lot of, um, people in my home department, which is an applied math department, who have a lot of computational skills, but um, have to learn the domain knowledge from their lab, which uh, is, is fine. And, um, you know, we read a lot of papers and get integrated and talk to people. But I think having the structure of a class to merge those would, would have been helpful for myself and for a lot of people that I know in my, my own department. What would be in such a class, this my Shay, any ideas? Um, I mean, I guess, I think it would be like machine learning for say earth sciences and it could be teaching um, the many like source of data that we use. For example, remote sensing data is very commonly used and uh, not only data processing, but then also at least the fundamentals of the physical process, these that you're dealing with. And um, I think there is a lot of pitfalls that happen to people with little domain knowledge where uh, you're not sure uh, if your results really make sense. And so there's a lot of like spinning of the wheels um, when you're not yet familiar with the domain. And I think a lot of effort can be spent going in the wrong direction uh, when you don't have the intuition yet. And obviously that's very hard to build. I mean, I think being interdisciplinary is inherently just very difficult and maybe you just have to go take the fundamental courses um, in the domain that you're in as well. But I think maybe, maybe a course with the angle of you already know computer science, um, like here are some applications that are commonly uh, using uh, computer science tools that could be Helpful. I'm not sure, just, just speculating. I could add another topic for that course, maybe translating between machine learning language and earth science language. Things like a grid cell versus a pixel. <laughs> it's just a, a language course for it. Yes, uh, I agree on this. And well, I also agree that um, I spend too much time on downloading data and writing batch jobs and so on. But so I think maybe something which should be more included in, in training is kind of interdisciplinary work, you know, like learning how to work with different fields because oh, I think it's impossible to catch up with all the developments in climate science and in computer science and so on. So it would be actually great to, um, yeah, start or learning earlier to how to collaborate with others and see what others need and what we can provide. I think 
building on what Marlene just said, uh, what I've noticed is that the, the labs I work with uh, recently started hiring students with both atmospheric science and computer science background. And I think that's the ideal setting to make it work is you really want a cohort of students that get along well and that can work with each, uh, with each other and teach each other uh, their specialty fields. Um, and I think you'll never be perfect in one domain or the other, but it's mostly bringing people together on similar projects with a lot of time spent together is probably for me one of the best way to have new ideas emerge that you hadn't thought of it before, thought of before. Tom, are you saying that when they hire, they hire some people who are machine learning people and some people who are atmospheric science, or do they hire people who already have both? No, I think it's almost impossible to find people who have both, and I don't, I don't know that it's necessary because if you're motivated to learn the other one, I, I think people should still have a shot at, at being hired. I, I think it's like hiring people from who have both, uh, one with the other, and putting them all together. Uh, but in the same lab, not having a CS lab and a neuroscience lab on uh, opposite sides of campus at some time email, putting everyone in the same lab, uh, I think could be a new model. Well, I think that is an awesome way to end this, which is really this concept of collaboration and that we really can't figure this all out. Because I, I think Rio's point, you know, or Marlena's point, actually, you can't learn all of climate and all of machine learning and computer science in one brain. Well, maybe somebody can, but, but I'm not capable of it. And so really, I think ending this, this panel discussion and the representatives we had here talking really span the space of really the domain to, to more of the computer science side. And so um, thank you. I think this is going to be a challenge we, that we are faced in many universities in the coming years of how do we do this right. And so, yes, we need to put everybody together in the same building, right? And have them be friends and good things will come of it. And so thank you everybody. Yeah. I just wanna say, I think it's no coincidence that many of the people who are here come from labs like this, who are already trying to merge a lot of those together. So thank so you. With that, thank you everyone. This was a great session and thank you everybody who's been watching um, and all the great questions. And there were definitely many, especially specific questions we did not have a chance to get to. Feel free, um, all of the speakers are happy to receive emails and, and I think chat offline if there's interest. So thank you again, and we'll see you all tomorrow for our last day of our KGML workshop. Thank you. Thank you so much.